Snap Wilson, quarterback draw on third and 15. 20, 15, 10, oh, he's going to go! Five, touchdown, Cougars! Down the lane, back to Yo. Yo on the arc, shoots a three, and scores it. Yo, the Childs for three. To the right, putting a shot on goal. It is a goal for Elise Blake. This is Behind the Mic with Greg Rubel, brought to you by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. And now, here's Greg Rubel. Well, good Wednesday evening, Cougar Nation, and welcome back inside Studio 2 at the BYU Broadcasting Building in Provo, Utah, for our season finale of Behind the Mic with Greg Grubel. It's our weekly and our final weekly hour of Cougar Conversations. Hope you enjoyed the last season and indeed the last two seasons of shows. My name is Greg Grubel, and we are live tonight on satellite via BYU Radio, Sirius XM 143. In northern Utah, we are heard over the air on 107.9 FM and 89.1 FM HD2. We are also streaming live online at BYUradio.org and on the BYU Radio app. You can hear our show on demand by subscribing to the Behind the Mic with Greg Rubel podcast or by going to BYUradio.org and look at the archives there for our Behind the Mic show page. On tonight's edition of the show, it's a full hour with BYU men's basketball head coach Dave Rose, our second full hour with Coach Rose this season. And here's why. Uh, Coach Rose has done too much for us to cover in one hour. Uh, When he first appeared on the show in late 2018, We got to talk about a lot of stuff Uh, growing up in California and Texas, uh, playing Juco ball at Dixie and major college ball for one of the most famous teams in history down in Houston. We talked about mission service to England. We talked about the decision to say goodbye to business and hello to coaching. We talked about climbing the coaching ladder from high school back to Juco and then back to Division I at BYU. And then the hour was over. Instead of just letting those BYU years become a brief postscript, to that interview, I wanted to bring Coach Rose back to talk about some of the uh, very best years in the history of BYU basketball. And whether or not Coach thought I was joking when I asked him to come back, he agreed to return. And so here he is back in Studio 2 joining me behind the mic. And just two days before BYU takes on uh, the West Coast Conference in Las Vegas. So it's uh, once again a pleasure to welcome in the coach with the highest win percentage in BYU coaching history. One of the top 10 winningest coaches in all of Division One, One win away from a 14th straight 20-win season. And we hope it's a 14th straight season too with an NCAA or NIT appearance once the dust clears at the Orleans Arena. Coach Rose, we see a lot of each other, I know, but it's good to see you again here behind the yeah, mic. Yeah, Greg, it's good to be here. And, and when when I did agree to uh, to come do this, March 6th seemed a long ways away. And it's, it's amazing how uh, time flies. It's uh, it's here, and I, I'm actually excited to talk about the BYU days. I mean, the 22 years that um, Cheryl and I and our family have been here have been just tremendous. So excited to be here. Yeah, I did kind of subtitle this thing, the BYU years, but I want to go back in the day way back in the day, just for a quick second, uh, for a BYU tie. As a basketball player who grew up in the church uh, and now coming out of Houston High School in the mid-'70s, it would have been, did you have interest in playing for BYU? Oh, absolutely. I, yeah, I was, uh, I, in fact, on my way to Dixie my sophomore year after my mission, Dixie was on the, on the, the, the quarter system, so we started late September. And so school had started here at BYU, and I came through town and, and got in a few runs uh, in the Smith Field House with – their team, and that was Danny Ainge and and Steve Craig and Greg Balif, and I mean there were some guys here that could really play on the guard line, and and I was hoping to go have a great year at Dixie, and then maybe um, you know have a chance to come up and play here, and it, it it didn't work out that way, and and I I mean I I didn't really understand as much at the time after coaching here for a while, I I understand there's a lot of really good LDS kids that are. Good enough players, good enough people to act, good enough students to actually be in our program, and there's just not enough room for everybody. And at that time, there were some really good guards, and and I kind of had a chip on my shoulder. You mm. know, I, I followed, uh, you know, BYU during those years, and I always felt really good at Houston when each year we finished a little bit better <laughs> than they did, you know, and and carried that around for a little while. But uh, I uh, I had a you know, there's, there's no way I can. Uh, um, be you know anything but just thrilled with what happened to me in my career. It turned out pretty well it for you. Turned out really well as a player. Yeah. How did you feel then, zipping ahead? How did you feel uh, about BYU when you were a high school and junior college coach in the state of Utah? You know that was interesting to me too because I, I um, you know, as as a high school coach, you know, I I, I had I coached a lot of LDS kids who really wanted to come to BYU. In fact. I was at Millard High, and Bob Jensen is a Millard High graduate, and, and Bob was uh, vying for – that's his name, right? Bob Jensen, quarterback. Quarterback. Yeah, 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 Bob Jensen. And uh, 
and so you know the the obviously the whole county was all obsessed with you know BYU and BYU football at the time and and uh, I was an assistant football coach there and so I was with the guys who actually coached him and he was a heck of an athlete a great track star and the basketball player but uh then when I went on to junior college that's when I realized that uh that Stan Watts had coached at Millard High School and then Stan Watts had been the head coach at Dixie College and so that was kind of an interesting, you know, BYU tie for me. Never, ever thinking that, you know, I was going to end up at BYU, let alone be the, you know, the head coach here. But uh, I, I do remember those things associated with BYU, that Bob Jensen and Stan Watts, and when we got to Dixie, there's Stan Watts again. You had been a successful head coach at Dixie College for seven seasons, six of which had uh, top 20 rankings. Things are going well. At the same time, up in Provo, things are winding down as they're going through a 1-25 in year that includes Roger Reed getting let go early in that season. How cognizant were you of what was happening at BYU while you were coaching down in Dixie? Well, I was pretty aware, you know, simply because uh, Utah Valley was a rival in our, um, in our league, and uh, I followed them really close. And when you followed Utah Valley at the time— you were kind of following BYU because the two brothers were the head coaches. You know, Duke was Duke, the head yeah. coach at the Utah Valley, and Raj was the head coach here. And they were, you know, shuffling players back and forth. Um, you know, I know that uh, Dalton Nixon's dad, Kevin, was the guy who came and played at Utah Valley, transferred from Northwestern and came and played at Utah Valley, and then transferred over here. Uh, uh, Craig Wilcox was the guy who played at Utah Valley and then came to BYU. So. Uh, I, I knew a lot of uh, – and I actually came and watched quite a few practices at BYU. Raj would let, let the coaches in the state come by, and and uh, and I was I was really intrigued on how he did things on the floor. He was an unbelievable statistician, a guy who could could just, uh, you know, get exactly what he wanted offensively, uh, you know, almost every possession. And so I enjoyed those days. In fact, I remember one day in the Smith Fieldhouse early in the season, I watched a practice – sitting next to Duke and he was critiquing, critiquing Raj, which I, <laughs> I think was kind of, kind of interesting and uh, nothing but great things to say about him. And uh, so I, I was pretty familiar with what was going on here. Yeah, what was Rod, Roger's reputation in the coaching world at that point? Well, just that, that he was, you know, as good of, uh, you know, floor coach as tactical guy, as you can yeah. find anywhere, you know, and that, uh, guys love playing for him, you know. As as this, this, it got on a little bit later, you know, I, I started to hear things that you know kids wanted to play a little bit faster and wish that maybe it was a little more up tempo. But everybody who had actually suited up and played for Raj, they knew that you know Raj knew his stuff and he was a great coach. And you get in any game with whatever the talent he had, he had a chance to win because he was a really good on the floor. It's kind of funny. Tony Ingle was just in town. He's been, he's around, but he was talking to your guys last week, I guess. And Tony was the guy that took over for Roger in that one and twenty-five season. Tony himself ends up going zero and nineteen, uh, which which just sounds like kind of a sad number until you realize that Tony doesn't let that get him down. He goes on and he wins national titles other places. Uh, but he was involved with that uh, one and twenty-five situation uh, that year. You know, and and he, you know, he'll tell you that. Uh when they offered him the job, that he, he, he was really hesitant. I mean, at that time, um, and it was, it, it was really, you know, once, once we, Steve and I got here, we realized, you know, what a situation it was because Lynn Archibald was coaching here with, pancre- I mean, with uh, prostate cancer and hadn't told anyone. Mm. And when they asked him to be the, the head coach when Raj left, um, he wasn't healthy enough to actually do it. And so he re- then he revealed to everybody that he was, you know, fighting this cancer. And they went to Tony, and, and Tony just said, you know, I this is kind of suicide here. I mean, we, 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 I, I wanted to be a head coach my whole life. And, you know, you, you're giving me eight freshmen right out of high school, and, you know, we won one game to this point, and he didn't really know what his chances were. But, you know, he did it because he felt obligated to the players, you know. And so he, he led the best he could and, you know, did exactly what uh, they had asked him to do, um, but you know, didn't win any games. And yeah. Then he had to fight for his job in that spring, and he ended up not getting it. So to that point, when BYU makes the permanent coaching change, and it's not going to be Tony, did you expect in any way that the coaching search would involve you? Um, you know, I kind of hoped that, that that maybe they'd reach out to a, a junior college kid, you know, in the state that you know won a lot of games, but uh, I didn't. 
I didn't really feel like I had, I had been involved in about three Division One head coaches coaching jobs from Dixie over the, that time period, and uh, I, I didn't get very far down the line in any of those, and realized that uh, that jump from a junior college head coach to a Division One head head coach probably was going to need to involve a couple more steps in between, besides just uh, going from one head job to the to the next at that level, but. Um, I was surprised when they reached out and Ronald Felberger contacted our um, athletic director and, and his assistant, and they wanted my resume. But that's about as far as I got involved in that. And so I, I, I put a resume together, and I sent it up here, and uh, I didn't really hear anything back from that. So when did you then have first uh, have real contact with either – Steve Cleveland or A.D. Rondo Felberg about the BYU job? And, and was it a step process where you were initially maybe being considered for the head job and it didn't go that way, but then they had a guy that wanted you to come with them? How did that work? Well, you know, I found out later that I was considered, yeah. you know, but uh, they were they were pretty far down the road uh, because uh, with Steve, um, you know, the R.J. Snow and, and uh, uh, you know, Lynn and the president at the time, they, they, they had – uh, Steve had a really good team at the time, and he was a, a finalist. In fact, almost got the Utah Valley job two years earlier when they gave it to Jeff Reinhardt. So as a fellow JUCO coach, did you guys know each other a little bit already? Or? I, I had met him about 18 months earlier. and okay. In fact, I'd met him to the point where uh, I got close enough to him to where he I convinced him to come to our tournament uh, in St. George at Dixie uh, with that really good team that he had with Rafer Alston and Ron Salise and those guys. Um, and so in November is when I really first got to know him. He came with his team. He was there three days. We, you know, uh, we had, had the tournament. I went to dinner with them, went to breakfast with them and we just kind of caught up and, and it was, it was interesting how, how many people we both knew, but we never had known each other, <laughs> you know? And, uh, so that, and then, you know, he went on and had his season. I had, we had our season and after he was hired as the head coach, um, he called me and, and, and we just talked about basketball in Utah, junior college basketball, high school basketball, coaches, LDS coaches that I knew. And uh, we had probably two or three conversations uh, of where he was just picking my brain, trying to find, you know, his staff and guys that he should recruit to get started on. You know, he wanted to know about the guys at Ricks and the players at Utah Valley and the players at Snow and the players at CEU, guys that I had, you know, Mm -hmm. obviously competed against for the last few years. So when did it get serious then about you joining him? Yeah, that that was – I don't really know when it got serious, but I I do know the night that he he called, it was late. It was, you know, around 10 o'clock, and I answered the phone and – he said that, uh, hey, I'm I'm in Kansas here. I'm trying to get back to Wichita. I just watched some games in Hutch and saw this kid and saw that guy. And and I said, you know, I said, well, we played against the, you know, and we just kind of had a casual conversation. But uh, then, at, you know, a couple minutes into the conversation, he said, hey, Dave, this and that's not why I called you. <laughs> and the reason I called you is because uh, you've told me all these guys and they all could probably do a really good job, but I'm – I'm pretty sure that you're the guy that's supposed to be my assistant coach. And I just I kind of laughed, kind of chuckled, and said, well, you know, I've got a pretty good thing here. And, and uh, I really kind of coach because I like to win. And <laughs> one win would be really hard on me, okay? And so uh, I, I don't really think I'm that interested in it. But uh, wow. And that's how that first conversation went. And So what I'm, changed? I hung up the phone. Well, what, what what he said, he said, yeah, I'd really like to talk to you about it. I said, okay, I'll talk to you about it. Um, and he said, face-to-face. And I said, well, I'm coming up there tomorrow uh, to watch an All-Star game. at uh, I think it was at Salt Lake Community College. And he said, well, hey, I'm flying home tomorrow morning early, and I'm going to be at that that game. So why don't I, I'll just pick you up at the airport, and uh, we'll drive over together and you know watch the game and chat and whatever. And, and that, you know, he picked picked me up. I think around four o'clock, and the, the game was at eight. And we were together all day, midnight. You know, I we checked in the hotel the next morning. We had breakfast, and he brought me down here to Provo. And then we sat in his office, and he gave me a, a pretty good spiel of his vision of what he had for uh, the place. And uh, so I drove home, or yeah, I think I did. I rode home with one of the uh, another coach, and. Uh, 
got home, talked to my wife, and, and I just thought that that would probably be the end of it. And the next morning, Cheryl said, you know what, you need to look into that. I think that's something that, uh, you know, maybe we should just give it the kind of the respect that it deserves because you always wanted to be a Division One head coach, and this might be the way that uh, the path for you. So let's let's take a look. And it was about three weeks later that it act- we actually closed the deal. <laughs> it, 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 it didn't go really quick for us. But uh, eventually I realized that this was what we needed to do and try to convince my kids of it. Garrett and, uh, you know, Taylor was just two at the time, so she was going to do whatever. But <laughs> Chanel was a tough one. She, you know, she was a sophomore in high school and played on four four sports. She was, a you know, an all-state basketball player and volleyball player, and she played softball, and she was a high jumper. And that was tough as a sophomore in high school to, to kind of leave all that behind. So... Um, but eventually it all worked out. That's how it happened. Hmm. So it was like, it was a process to get you to become a BYU guy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I remember about a week after that, um, uh, that all-star game, I was back up here recruiting and I'd brought, um, Cheryl with me because I wanted Cheryl to meet Steve. And, uh, and we got back in the same office on the same couch and he put the spiel on her <laughs> and, uh, and, and, that that uh, I mean, he Steve was good. Steve Steve could make you feel like he knew. Like, I mean, one of the real gifts that he had is in recruiting. He just had a real knack of making people feel really, really comfortable and really, um, you know, you just believe what he said because he was really confident and really sure of himself. I'm sure you needed some personal confirmation at some point, though, that this was all supposed to be what you were supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah, and that was, uh, you know. That was a hard thing because we'd built a, a great program at Dixie, and and I loved living there. I loved St. George. I loved the weather. I loved the people. Um, you know, Cheryl had a, a great job at the university, and, and I was, um, you know, I, I guess I was kind of in a place where um, I wanted a little bit more, and, and um, but I never thought that this would be the place. You know, I always had a, a vision that maybe – you know, I would leave here and like I was at the state tournament the other day at uh, up at Weber State in in uh, the D event center and Cheryl and I walked in and I just said to her, I said, you know, it's just crazy because I came up here to state tournaments as a high school coach, coaching my team. I came up here as a junior college coach, watching, um, you know, the, the these uh, Utah kids play for years and years, and every time I came in here, I would say, "Man, this would be the greatest job ever if I could ever just, you know, get a chance to maybe be a coach at Weber State." You know, not knowing, you know, what was in store for me—that's for sure. Hmm. All right, we come back. Uh, Dave Rose becomes a Cougar by joining the new head coach Steve Cleveland on the BYU bench. When behind the mic with Greg Rubel continues, you're listening to us here on BYU Radio, Sirius XM 143, BYU Radio dot org, and the BYU Radio app. You're listening to Behind the Mic with Greg Rubel, brought to you by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Welcome back to Behind the Mic, visiting with BYU head basketball coach Dave Rose tonight. And uh, before the break, we got Dave up to Provo, joining Steve Cleveland's first ever BYU coaching staff. And let's just remember, remind folks who was on that first staff with you guys. Yeah, it was um, um, myself and Nate Call and Heath Schroyer. And then we created a new position, uh, basketball operations, and Brian Santiago was uh, the uh, the director of basketball operations. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, we, we laugh about this all the time. Uh, Brian was sharing the office with uh, Coach Cleveland, and it was only kind of a part-time gig for Brian. And so he had to do some other things to supplement his income. And he was running a business out of that office. And there were times when he had phone calls and he had to ask the head coach to leave because <laughs> he, he had to, you know, negotiate some deals. And so Steve would come in my office, you know, and we'd sit there and talk, you know, strategy and talk about the game, talk about recruiting, talk about stuff while Brian was in there doing business. But and the op- anybody who knows Brian, that doesn't sound, you know, like it would be uh, – 
you know, too far out uh, of a stretch, but it's the exact truth. <laughs> there aren't too many situations where the ops guy gets to tell the head coach to, <laughs> That's right. I, I need to do some work here. Go, yeah, go but find but some Brian, But, you know, in Brian's defense, Cleve had to do a real sell job on Brian to get <laughs> Brian to come because – he wanted Brian because Brian was a Provo guy, and mm-hmm. he, had, he, had, he knew the history of BYU basketball. He knew high school basketball in Utah, and he wanted – and he was a, a really good player at Fresno State and played at Utah Valley, and, he, and, and they, were, they, were real, they were acquaintances in Fresno, and he wanted Brian to come on a really kind of a shoestring deal. And, uh, you know, obviously that job's become a much better position you know, <laughs> now that Andrew May has than it was way back then. But uh, so I think he, he, he had some concessions, you know, for, for Brian because of <laughs> you know, how he had to talk him right. into coming. That first season with you and Coach Cleve and the rest, uh, you guys go 9-21. and 21. So it wasn't the one-win season. It was a nine-win season. Uh, and and there, there's a guy, speaking of the number nine, there's a guy on that first roster that is the ninth all-time scorer at BYU now. And that's McKelly Wesley. He was a big part of that first team. Absolutely. And, and that, you know, I tell, I tell a lot of stories of a lot of teams, um, you know, when I speak at, at firesides and kind of motivational speaks, uh, speeches that we give, and we go around talking to a lot of – but I, t- I talk about that team a lot, and you wouldn't think that – the nine and twenty-one team would get much of uh, um, you know credit as far as what I learned from that team, but those guys were just warriors. They were, they took it all on themselves, and you know they knew that there was a challenge. And McKelly knew that, you know, when he signed that there was he didn't know how big a situation we were in, but he knew that we were in a little bit of trouble. And um, it was you know I watched him play AAU ball, and so I knew he was you know a, a really high quality player. But for those guys to be able to, you know, fight the way they did, and then you know, get ourselves, um, you know, into the tournament, the WAC tournament, and, and just it, getting into the WAC tournament was an accomplishment because oh, yeah. not everyone made it. You had to qualify to get in that yeah. thing, and so I, you know, I, I, I tell the story of how, how those guys hung in there together and and uh, really believed in each other. And when they come back, when that group of guys comes back, like a year ago, we had a big reunion. Uh, th- those are really special hugs and handshakes because uh, we went through a lot together. The next year, you got another one of those foundational guys because Mark Bigelow came in, and Mark was another one of those guys that kind of had to do, do the leap of faith. He's pretty, pretty highly touted, and had to kind of trust things were going to be on the way up. That that was when we realized that uh, you know there's some you know really good families out there who uh, you know raise their kids to to you know want to wear the BYU blue and you know. Mark's parents, you know, they they were, you know, they were nervous during the whole process because they wanted him to come here, and and Mark had um, unbelievable offers to play anywhere in the West Coast. He was a heck of a player, and and Mike, you know, even to this day when I see Mike, I've seen Mike at a football game, you know, BYU football game uh, last year, and uh, there's a real a real connection between. Um, you know, our staff and Mike because of Mike's the dad, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's yeah. how hard uh, you know we we had to. Uh, again, it was mostly <laughs> Cleve. Cleve could sell, man. He was <laughs> he was really good, and and he had a vision for what this place was going to be, and it wasn't you know happening at the time. But he sold that vision. So you go you go two years uh, without postseason play. You get to the conference tournament, but not but no postseason, true postseason. But the next year, the third year, uh, it's the NIT after a twenty two and eleven year, and because of where BYU'd been, kind of a drought of postseason play. That NIT that year felt like a pretty big deal, and then you got two teams in the Marriott Center, and that place was rocking. You remember you remember those games. I mean, yeah. you still when you think about some of the. The the most you know exciting rowdiest crowds in the Marriott Center. It's a couple. You go of right those, there. A couple yep. of those NIT games. Think Bowling Green and and, and, and Southern uh, Illinois, right? Yeah. The two that come in. And and they were uh, Dan Dockage was the coach of one. The, the same Dan Dockage yeah. that knows everything. Right. You know when you right. listen to uh, you know Big Big Ten basketball, but he brought a squad in here that was pretty good, and uh, you know we won both those games, and that was uh, you know the, 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 that was a real step forward. You know, there's a couple things that I really remember. That really stand out. Um, those NIT wins obviously were really big to, to just because of the excitement that was in the Marriott Center. Mm-hmm. I mean, Greg, we played some games in the Marriott Center where they, they you know, they listed the official crowd as around three thousand, and there wasn't three thousand people in there. You know, it was a lot less than that, and so that excitement in there was tremendous. I remember we we sold out one of the first couple years at against Utah, and the whole place was red. 
You know, <laughs> they, we sold out because everybody came to watch, you know, the Utes beat the Cougars. And so um, that Southern Illinois game drew 17,000 fans, yeah. and those were fresh tickets. Fresh tickets, yeah. yeah. In a couple of days, you know, they sold those. So uh, that, that, was, that was big. And, and another really big thing, and I can't remember, it was a couple, maybe a couple of years later, but when we beat Utah. In the in the Mountain West Conference tournament down in Vegas uh, for our, our first time getting them, uh, those that's when I really felt that hey, you know what we had, we'd turned this thing and now it's time to start getting to the NCAA tournament, winning championships. And that happened in 2001, getting back to the NCAA tournament, and that was the year that BYU goes down to Vegas and wins the conference tournament at the Thomas and Mac. Uh, Beating at the time Air Force, Wyoming, and New Mexico on back to back nights. Yeah, that Three. New Mexico yeah. was the same Fran Fraschilla that's on TV yeah, every day yeah. telling everybody, you know, how to coach. <laughs> and, uh, you know, those those were fun. Trent Whiting had a huge shot in the corner. I still remember, you know, how we beat them. And we were in the championship game, and Vegas was actually not in the tournament that year. They were ineligible of, that they, one they year. Had, yeah. They had some issues. And so, um, but that was and, – and, you know, the other thing I'm reminded of, of course, every time at this year is that that's the last time we actually won the postseason tournament, you know, as far as our conference is concerned. So it would be nice if we could win one, you know, in a couple of days and get past that. But that was really the – I mean, that was – you're back now. Yeah. BYU basketball is back when you're back in the dance, right? Yeah. And, I, and I've, you know, I, I've felt it, – it felt so different going out on the road and, and, and talking with players and high school coaches – uh, just in that, you know, which seemed like forever, but it was a pretty short period of time in in the basketball world to take a team from one win to an NCAA tournament, and uh, and then things started rolling. It was it, it got to where we could we could get in the the houses of most every LDS kid. Uh, the first season I was here, um, you know, we're, we're trying to recruit, recruit Casey Jacobson and uh, you know Chris Burgess and some of these guys. And uh, it was a phone call and, you know, thanks but no thanks and good luck. And and then, you know, it, it turned into the fact that the, the top guys, we could actually have real communication, got most all of them to visit. And, you know, you get guys to visit here and you got a pretty good chance to get them. After that NCAA tournament year uh, of 2001, you lose that great trio, McKelly, Trent, and Terrell. Uh, next year is an NIT year where I think we end up playing Coach Cal, right? Cal Perry in Memphis. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we they, went had, there. they had Wagner. Uh, Dewan Wagner? Dewan Wagner's yeah. son. Yeah. Oh, no, the, Dewan well, was, the, yeah, was, the, was yeah. Milt Wagner because Milt was his dad, and I played against Milt. He was on the staff, in the, though, then, right? In, yeah. in the Louisville game in the, the Final Four my senior year, and uh, and his son was the guy. I mean, he was good. And we got down there, and uh, we, we, we played him tough for a while, but they beat us at the end. And, and that was a game to go – where we would go to New York, we won that game. No, no I think it was, I think it was actually uh, just the second round okay. game, yeah, of the NIT yeah. that year. Yeah, we beat uh, Irvine in the first one here at home. Had to go to Memphis right yeah. away, and then took on a Coach Cal team there. Then it was back to back NCAA tournaments, uh, two thousand three, two thousand four. Back in the dance, we're talking about Travis, Mark Bigelow's back now. Hoffa, his two years were two great years for you, and and dances both years. That was, I mean, that that recruiting story with Hoffa was. Uh, it was <laughs> so what know, is it? it it's, <laughs> And you, you know, sometimes you you work as hard as you possibly can, and then something has to happen to make it fall into your lap. And it just so happened that Hoffa came from Brazil, went to Yuma to Arizona Western, and you know is 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 being recruited by everyone in the country. You know, six eleven, everybody knows him. He could he was as good a defensive rebounder as I think I've ever seen. But he starts dating an LDS girl, and they end up getting married. And she, Cheyenne, was the number one recruiter, you know, in that deal. She wanted him to be exposed to uh, to the church. And when it came right down to it, you know, and with the help of, you know, Walter, Walter Ruiz was, uh, mm-hmm. you know, on our staff as a DOPS guy at the time. And so those those kind of things. Or no, he was a graduate assistant at the time. And, uh, you know, we ended up getting him. And that was a big, big get for us. He ends up being an NBA guy, of course. Uh, I mentioned Travis and Mark Bigelow in that same sentence. And Mark wasn't a pro guy, at least in the NBA, but Travis was also drafted. So we see Travis um, drafted after his senior year, Hoffa drafted after his senior year, which kind of gets me into maybe a sidetrack note. Um, th- there's value into staying the whole way through, being as good as you can possibly be as a collegian, and then letting the pro thing take its course. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's, there is no question that... The NBA guys look a lot longer and a lot harder at the guys who stay for four years. I mean, that's how 
you know, Kyle Collinsworth ended up playing, you know, in the, in the league. He's had two seasons in the NBA. Brandon Davies stayed four years, and he's, you know, had two seasons. Uh, Jimmer was you know, a four-year guy. Jimmer was a four-year guy. And so that's, uh, you know, and, I, and I, I'm friends with a lot of those GMs. And uh, Gar Foreman with the Chicago Bulls told me straight up, he says, sometimes when these kids want to come out a little bit early, they don't get the look that they deserve because the GMs, uh, they just don't have time to, 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 to unless you're, you know, the top 14 or 15 guys. So, uh, you know, some programs have that, you know, figured out pretty well. We, we've we been on kind of the back end of that the last <laughs> couple of years. And, and uh, you know, hopefully guys will, will get the evaluation. It's all set up so much better now that they can go and they can investigate it. They can look at it. They can stay in it if they go to the combine. And if they don't get drafted, then they can have a, uh, you know, opportunity to return if that's what they think. So after those NCAA tournaments I mentioned in 03 and 04, it's Coach Cleve's final year the next year. It's 04, 05. There are some injuries. It becomes a 9-21 and season. Interestingly, the 9-21 and matches the first yeah. record you guys had together as coaches. Then he gets the Fresno State opportunity at that point. Um, were you full speed ahead for the BYU job at that point? Well, that was interesting, you know, because uh, Steve didn't really t- tell uh, me about – um, what he was going to do for you know quite a while into it I, at, at the Final Four um, that year is in St. Louis and and uh, Cheryl and I and, and Kip and Steve had uh, taken one of the days and we were we were driving to Nauvoo uh, which I can't remember how far away but it was maybe a three or two or three four hour drive and on the drive is when he said hey this is getting pretty serious and these guys have made me an unbelievable offer and I'm looking into it and after the the final forum. We're going to fly over there and then talk to the president on campus. They're going to show me all the plans that they in have. Fresno. In Fresno. Yeah. And uh, I was pretty sure at, at that time that he was going to take the job because he, I don't think he would have gone to, to that distance. Plus, they were just putting so much pressure on him to come fix the the hometown school that he grew up was born and raised there. So uh, had family and you know. You know, just yeah, I just felt that there was a lot of pressure for him to do that, and um, and so when that happened, I I, I kind of oh well, what's what's going to happen to me? I mean, can I come with you, or <laughs> if that's going to happen, what are we going to do? And and you know, he was you know really supportive of me getting a job here, and so I think it was a Tuesday night. He came back. We met at the marriage center. He said, "Dave, I'm I'm flying back there tomorrow. They're going to announce me as the head coach." and um, I think he talked to Tom, and then Tom and I met that night to talk about the, the future. I, I kind of just told him that that I wanted this job, and this was my obviously number one choice. That's what I would really like to do. But Steve's offered me a spot with him to go to Fresno, and and he said that uh, he's going to talk to President Samson, and then we'll we'll figure it out and see where we go. So. Wasn't as long a process as the first time to get you here, was it? No, no, this one went a lot quicker, and I, and I was—I uh, I didn't need to be talked into anything. Yeah, I, I knew what I wanted then. Yeah. All right. When we come back, uh, Coach Rose becomes the new head man at BYU, ushering in an era of unprecedented success. As behind the mic with Greg Grubel continues here on BYU Radio, Sirius XM One Forty Three, BYU Radio dot org, and the BYU Radio app. Welcome back to Behind the Mic, brought to you by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Here's your host, Greg Rubel. Final show with Coach Dave Rose with us for the entire hour as the Cougs get ready to head to Las Vegas for the WCC tournament. They'll play Saturday night right here on BYU Radio. And as we uh, pick up our narrative of Coach Rose's career, he's now the head coach at BYU. And so 2005-06, Coach Rose, is your first year as the head coach. And as coaches do, they get together and, and, and do a preseason pick. And you were in a nine-team league, the Mountain West Conference, and the coaches said BYU would be the ninth-place team. And what, what I, mean, I think – Insult to injury. I think that we had just added a team. And they they were picked finished. TCU just come in. <laughs> they were picked finished eighth or right ahead of us, and so that was a that was an interesting. Uh, I remember calling Brian, uh, you know, and and just telling him that hey, these these guys picked us ninth, and I'll promise you this, we won't finish ninth. And you know, we, we it was it was a motivating factor for our guys. You know, you know, it, it, it's interesting because. That team and that that pick and you know how all that played is kind of reminds me a little bit of Utah State's first year under Craig Smith. You know that 
They were picked ninth. They were picked to finish yeah. way down the yeah. down the. And, and he had a group of guys that were really pretty talented players, but were tired of getting beat. And that's what we had. We we had a group of guys that you know had won nine games the year before. Were better than that. They felt in their heart it was a really tough schedule. I mean, my goodness, Pete Rubbeck could put a real schedule on us that year. And uh, um, this, this this group, you know, Austin Ainge was a big part of that. Brock Richner was my son-in-law was yeah. in that group. And I I know a lot about the the inner workings of that team. We, we recruited some good junior college guys and brought them in, but that team from day one just didn't want to lose. And when you don't want to lose, then what you really want to do is you just want to win. And that's how we played. That's how we practice. That's how we act. And the one thing that I do know for, for you know coaching here for quite a while and all my experience as a coach is that getting a team from an average place or a low place to a high place is a lot easier than keeping, a play, than keeping them as a champion mm. and managing that uh, it, because there's a real – attitude to managing success that uh is pretty special you've you've got to have um you know the right kind of guys the right kind of staff uh but everybody at the first hey let's just prove everybody wrong let's just all be together let's just win and then when you start winning and you win championships a lot of other stuff creeps in and Mm -hmm. the managing that is is a lot a lot more difficult your first year ends up not ninth, but tied for second in the league, and you win 20 games, 20 and 9, and that 20 win standard becomes a standard that has been upheld now for 14 straight seasons, or we hope you're one win away from 20 this year. Um, and I, I, I still maintain it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a worthwhile and, and worthy standard as long as teams play basketball. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, you know. The, it, it, I relate so much so much of what has happened to me to what's happening right now and you know you find out last night that Kansas loses at Oklahoma and that's their 14 years of winning the Big 12 it's and over. now it's over right. and there's so many people that have so many things to say about it uh the best article I read was let's not be upset that uh the uh you know that that, that Kansas you know lost and it isn't the champion for the you know 14th straight or 15th straight year. Let's be happy that they were champions for 14 straight years. And sometimes that's really hard to look at that. It, it's it's hard to find a way that you're going to look at a glass if it's half full or half empty. But um, the fact that that we've had um, you know pretty good success here as far as winning games um, is a, a, a tremendous reflection on our players and our coaches, the guys who have been here and been in the trenches and doing it and. Um, it's not easy, mm-hmm. and it's not. Uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. You know, there are a lot of people that make take it for granted. I don't take it for granted. I know how hard it is, and uh, I, 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 there are so many more things we want to do. But winning games is something that we've been able to do. It was not easy to get the twenty wins that first year, and I think it would, it would have been a bigger deal now because it, everything's a bigger deal. It seems, but you got to actually play at Houston yeah. in your old court yeah. for, in the NIT, and that was that was uh, an exciting game for me. Um, to go down there and and make the postseason, you know, I mean, when you're a first year head head coach of Division One, you you don't, I mean, there's a lot that goes through your mind. We lost our first game in the Marriott Center to LMU, yep. and and I remember sitting in the locker room <laughs> our second game up in Spokane in the Spokane Civic Center. We're playing Washington State, a Washington State team coached by Dick Bennett and Tony Bennett, and they had a great team. In fact, they ended up, uh, you know, the next two or three years dominating the kind of the Pac-12 before Tony went to Virginia. And I'm sitting in that locker room, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, I have a three-year contract. It's worth this much money. What can I actually – I can pay off a couple of credit cards. But, you know, how, how can I manage this for three years? Wondering if I ever win a game. And we go out there, and, you know, we win that game. I remember Sean Verotis made a big steal on him. And uh, they were running a high 1-4, uh, you know, UCLA kind of set. And we he stole it from behind. Brock made some threes in that game. But – we won it and and go into in the locker room, have an unbelievable celebration and and then started to really believe that, you know what, we can do this. But if I wouldn't have, if I wouldn't have won that game and we'd have lost another and you know, you get into like four or five games where you haven't won, my goodness. I mean it it, it could have gone south really easy but uh our guys fought through it and made it work. I still remember being in the Spokane arena and still sitting at courtside doing some wrap up stuff and 
and you don't always hear the celebration from the locker room, but I could hear yeah, it that night. That was, I could uh, hear it that Derek night. Dawes, Derek Dawes was the man in that celebration, <laughs> boy. It, it was a, it was a, a relief to me, but I mean, just really fun and, and genuine by the guys. And, and that's, you know, we've had a lot of celebrations in locker rooms after wins over the, the years here. Um, but I, I don't ever remember one where, I mean, every guy, it didn't, they were all, you know, just genuinely happy and excited and ready to roll. That that first season ends up in the NIT, as we talked about. Then you make six straight NCAA tournaments. Um, has making the NCAA tournament gotten harder? Oh, no question, especially for where we sit, you know, where, where BYU sits. I think it's easier uh, to make the tournament in a Power 5 conference, and everyone says that's a little bit crazy. But the fact that, you, that I've always been a guy that thinks that anybody – can beat anybody on their home floor. And so if they, it doesn't matter who you bring in here, the, the home team has a chance to win. And you get in some of those leagues and you can get four or five top, you know, 24, 25 teams come into your place, you got a chance to win one, two, three of them. And it's hard to get those guys to come into our uh, our arena. A lot harder now, especially after eight out of nine years we go to the NCAA tournament. Mm-hmm. The, the one thing that people don't understand, at that time especially, most teams were flying commercial. You had to fly into Salt Lake, you to take the bus from Salt Lake down here, go coaches say it's an hour drive. It's probably going to be snowing. You're playing at 5,500 feet. You don't want to go there. You don't want to do that. And that was a big part of me for years, just trying to convince teams that, hey, listen, this, it, it, this is a great place to play. Bring your team in here. There'll be a great crowd. You'll get a great you know, preseason game. Uh, our RPI is usually really good. It'll really help you, you know, in the numbers, but – it it uh, it's hard to sell, really hard to sell. Maybe I should hire Cleve to come in because <laughs> that, that dude can sell. That. That's what I heard. Uh, in those six straight NCAA seasons run, you had a number of guys who never missed a big dance. Uh, Jimmer, JT, among them. Yeah, and uh, I that was a really big part. You know, I remember Tom Izzo used to say that he had a Final Four run, and he wanted every kid on in his program to experience the Final Four. Well, that's how – I mean, I had a real passion for that with my guys to experience the NCAA tournament. And and we had a, gr- a great run. And someday I'll go back and look at it and try and figure it all out. But we had um, maybe three, four, maybe five rosters where every guy got a chance to uh, experience uh, that tournament, which is just really special. In the midst of this run, uh, after the two – I can't believe it's been, it's been 10 years – since that summer um, where your life took a U-turn. Yeah, that, was, uh, that wasn't that was only a, a change in in basketball, but uh, it, was, it was a change from you know top to bottom as far as how I looked at life. And uh, We're coming up on 10 years, aren't we? Yeah, June, June, June will be 10 years, June 5th or 6th. And um, I've, uh, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, it's, it's actually taken um, – a part of my life and, and complicated it a little bit because I'm so involved with cancer and trying to, you know, raise money to bring awareness and to fight the disease. And, and, and then there are so many individuals that I come in contact with that uh, I just, they want me to share my story with them to kind of give them a little bit of hope when they're fighting cancer. And so um, there's not a, I'm going to say a week, maybe a week, maybe two weeks that goes by where, I don't uh, talk to somebody in the community, you know, in the LDS community, um, where they reach out and, and we talk about their struggle, and and then it allows me to tell my story and how fortunate I've been and how blessed we've been, and and I think uh, Cheryl will tell you, all my kids, every, grand, everybody will tell you that it's uh, it's it's hard to say this because it's it, it's been a good thing. It's been a good thing for me. It's been, it's made me appreciate so many more parts of a lot of life and my job and what I get to do. And um, my wife, she always says that I was sprinting a marathon and I just didn't look around and see what was actually happening. And uh, I actually ran a marathon once, walked a lot during the marathon, and I, I kind of relate to that because. Uh, I was just uh, – I had blinders on and, and a lot of life was passing me by and I think I've been able to enjoy life a lot more um, since I've been diagnosed with the cancer. It's usually on occasions like this that I tend to ask you uh, how the most recent scans have gone and how you're feeling. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, we, know we had a scan right before the season. I've been really fortunate. The doctors have been terrific. But the way that 
my my cancer has been managed. You know, it's a scan right after the season. So April, I'll have a, another scan, but then we do it in September. They're every six months. And the, the times that I've actually had to have procedures have shown up in the April scans. Every September scan has been clear. I've had one issue that I had to have a little bit of a, a treatment during a, a September and missed a practice or two, but haven't missed a game, uh, you know, and, and, and been able to make almost every recruiting trip that I've ever scheduled except that one summer, that very first summer. I missed a, uh, the first session of, of a 10-day session in July, but I made it um, to Vegas in the last 10 days because I could drive down there. I couldn't fly yet after the surgery and operation. And, um, so it, it, it's just amazing that I've been able to continue to coach and be treated and, you know, be healthy and strong enough mm-hmm. to, to you know, get 10 years in. As we head to break, um, when, when someone asks you to uh, talk about the Sweet 16 season, the Jimmermania year, what's the best way to describe that to somebody? Well, we made a, a video out of it, and the, the <laughs> video is called Amazing, and there's a song on there. I, I think that's probably as, as you know, descriptive as you can get. I mean, it was... It was amazing. I, and I talked about this a little bit last night on our coaches' show, that the consistency that he showed in that year is second to none. And maybe the next is Yoli's year this year. I mean, Yoli has been so consistent. I mean, he had one game, I think, where he didn't score in double figures, all the double-doubles that he's had. It doesn't matter the talent level. It doesn't matter the scheme that they've put on, uh, the double team, the triple team, the, you know, uh, the physical play, I mean, it's, it's just been amazing how good he's been and consistent. But that's what I remember the most about Jimmer is just how consistent he was during that year. And then the support that he got from Jax and Noah and Charles and Brandon. I mean, that was that was an amazing group of guys. And, uh, I tell stories about Logan Magnuson as mm-hmm. one of the best teammates that's ever been through here and, uh, and his role on our scout team and then his – Big jumpers against Wafford in the first round, <laughs> you know, in Denver. Need, but, needed a shot in the yeah, arm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, but but that's that's what I remember the most about about that team is, and and and, and people ask me the, like someone asked me the other day, what what do you remember? We're like I was Tony Engel. What was it like coaching Jimmer? What do you remember the most about Jimmer? The, the guy took the most shots. He was like James Harden, dribbled the ball around like nobody else. I mean, from my teams, the teams mm-hmm. that we've had here for 14 years, you watched them all. That guy pounded the ball more than anybody, took more shots, came off of more ball screens, took more free throws, and he was the most liked guy on the team. Now that's hard to do. That's really hard to do in this game yeah. when everybody wants a piece, you know, and, and Jimmer was just a likable guy, and he still is. I, I saw – a picture that Whitney posted the other day on Instagram and it the, the, has all the, the the Chinese guys that are on his team and they're all just the most serious look ever. And Jimmer's got this huge smile on his face and Whitney posted, this is the the photographer saying, give me your serious look. And Jimmer's <laughs> yeah. got a smile, you know, about the size of, you know, his whole face. So I, I, that that's, that's what I remember most about Jimmer is just how happy and, and how uh, likable he was. That's who he is. All right, break time. We come back. A few year, a few words about the uh, post Jimmer years or the WCC years, if you will. As behind the mic with Greg Rubel continues, we're visiting with Dave Rose here on BYU Radio, Sirius XM one forty three, BYU Radio dot org, and the BYU Radio app. You're listening to Behind the Mic with Greg Rubel, brought to you by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Last few moments here with uh, BYU men's head basketball coach uh, Dave Rose. And uh, BYU left the Mountain West Conference in a season that included beating Gonzaga to get to the Sweet 16. Did you have any sense then what Gonzaga would come to mean to the WCC and then to your program in terms of a rivalry and somebody you have to beat? You know, I I had no idea. Cheryl and I, that um, summer, okay, before it was actually announced what was happening, we actually went up to Mark and, and Marcy's uh, big gala that they have a fundraiser for the American Cancer Society. We we're in Spokane for three days, and uh, you know I think I think by that time that it had been announced that we were going to you know make that that move. But uh, I you know I was, I'm, we're, we're talking. Cheryl gives a nice you know 
10, 15 minute speech. I give a 30 minute speech and we're mingling with all those boosters and they have a big auction. They raise a million dollars. And I realized pretty quick that I was out of place, <laughs> you know, because, uh, it, it, it's turned into quite a, uh, a challenge for us here at BYU to, to tackle that Gonzaga. You agreed to a contract extension a few months ago as the season began. Uh, do you see an end, or do you just see more games and more seasons? I see more games and more seasons. I, I, I want to do this as long as I feel um, you know, healthy and I'm excited and, and the, the wins are exciting, the losses have always been tough, but... Uh, I th- there's a feel in me that we are you know I think it'll come when I realize that you know maybe I um you know maybe I need to do something else it's it's not around yet so hopefully we can keep going. Okay, last couple of things tournament time and then I want to take the last minute to just meet most people know who they are but I'd like you to kind of uh, name the people in your family that gets larger and larger but uh, maybe a quick word about heading to Vegas and what you hope is around on the horizon. Well this there. is always uh, such an exciting time you know and I think that uh this year, you know, I think our fans are are really excited about the tournament. Um, you know, we 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 easily could have had a number two seed, you know, and uh, let that San Francisco game get away from us at the end. But uh, uh, the way this works, the three seed playing on Saturday, it allows us to go into the tournament on a normal week where we're practicing on a Thursday, we're practicing on a Friday, and we play on a Saturday. You go into that tournament a little bit nervous playing on Monday where you don't practice on. Um, Sunday and everybody else is you kind of warmed up into the thing. That's a little nerve wracking. So you just stay with the positive things and uh, and look forward to uh, winning that first game. That first game is uh, what you got to get past. Okay, you have your on court support staff. You have your off court support staff. Your off court support staff is uh, Cheryl and everybody else. Yeah, obviously Cheryl is uh, <laughs> extremely invested <laughs> in uh, in this you know this program and obviously my career and. Uh, we have three wonderful kids, and, and you know Chanel and Garrett and, and Taylor, and their spouses Brooke and uh, Brock uh, is uh, a former you know player here, and and then Willie is uh, Taylor's husband. They're up in Portland uh, at law school, William and Clark. I mean William and Lewis and Clark, and uh, they follow from kind of a, a, a distance, and then all our grandkids. So uh, it's a uh, it's not a real normal kind of lifestyle the 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 whole family my my grandkids are starting to swim now and they're actually really good swimmers annie and and kate are they've got their own schedules and things they do and we're all trying to get around and follow everything but uh this byu basketball dominates the family it has and probably will continue to be Dave, pleasure having you in tonight. I uh, look forward to the weekend and then whatever's next. You got to you got to put in my uh, my mom and dad too. Yeah, you know, true I'm gonna tell you this year, I'm giving a lot of credit to my dad. He fought like heck and made it to the last four or five home games. Uh, he's in the middle of you know fighting another battle with cancer, but uh, I, I love my parents and the support they've given me. The one thing I'll say about my dad and mom is that I had a full ride scholarship through college, my two years at junior college and at University of Houston. And my dad says he spent more money putting me through college than he did all the rest of the kids put together because he had to travel following around to every game. So he's still doing it. So kudos to my mom and dad. It's always great to see him and them at games. We'll back to wrap, wrap up tonight's show right after this. My conversation with Dave Rose tonight was brought to you by BYU Alumni. BYU Alumni chapters help students in need and spread the influence of the Y around the world. Stay connected for good and find your chapter at alumni.byu.edu slash chapters. Thanks to my coordinating producer, Terry South. And for Terry, my name is Greg Grubel, thanking you for tuning in to Behind the Mic with Greg Grubel here on Sirius XM 143, byuradio.org, the BYU Radio app, 107.9 FM and 89.1 FM HD2. So for tonight... Good night and go Cougs.